Hello everybody and uh, welcome. You're watching CNBC Africa. We are live from Johannesburg. We are talking about the African continental free trade area and our topic today is unlocking Africa's dynamic possibilities through the AFC FTA. Now the African continental free trade area's success will depend on deliberate and focused interventions by African governments. Today, in celebrating Africa Month, we connect one of the biggest players in the realization of the AFC FTA, Gauteng Province, home to Africa's biggest manufacturing hub, together with Ghana, seat of the AFC FTA Secretariat, and home, of course, where it all began 58 years ago. My name is Godfrey Mutizwa. I am 58. You can read what you want about that. But for today, I'm your moderator for what I hope will be an informative session on ideas to grow intra-African trade for the Africa we want. For our viewers who would like to take part in this conversation, you can tweet your comments and thoughts on our hashtag GGDA Knows Africa, hashtag Africa Month 2021, hashtag Unlocking Africa, and hashtag AFC FTA. You can also tag me at G Motizwa. Let's meet the first speaker of today. Keynote address by Wamkele Mene, Secretary General, African Continental Free Trade Area. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, very, very important uh, conversation which is timely uh, during Africa Month. A very critical question is how do we use, how do we leverage the African continental free trade area to unlock Africa's potential, to unlock growth, create jobs uh, on the African continent. We know that for a very long time, we have been characterizing Africa as a continent of the future, a continent of hope, and a continent of tomorrow. Where well, we believe that actually Africa is not the continent of the future, that Africa is the continent of today, and that we have to unlock Africa's future today and create opportunities for young Africans, for small medium enterprises, especially small medium enterprises that are, are led by women. When you characterize Africa's economy since the end of uh, colonialism, uh, I think in general, we can characterize it as follows. Smallness of uh, national economies, market fragmentation, disconnection of uh, regional markets, um, uh, lack of industrial capacity, lack of productive or shallowness of productive base, a continued uh, reliance on the export of primary commodities. And all of these factors uh, lead to Africa having a very, very low rate of intra-Africa trade of, of 18%. And we continue to be trapped. And in some circumstances, we continue ourselves as Africans to sustain um, what I call is Africa's uh, colonial economic model. Uh, this over-reliance on the export of commodities and whose consequence we know, um, we know what happens when uh, global commodities markets are subdued, as has been the case uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, Africa suffers. And so we have to uh, accelerate Africa's industrial development if we want to unlock the growth potential that we all know uh, that Africa has. We've got to make sure that uh, through industrial development then, and through connectivity of regional value chains that we rapidly move fast, we rapidly, rapidly move to value added production, a trade specialization uh, based on regions, based on country, on the African continent. We have a market, as you know, of 1.2 uh, billion people. 
with a combined GDP of 3.4 trillion United States dollars. That potentially places the African continent to be as competitive as India and China, uh, globally and regionally. But of course, we know that uh, today, Africa is not as competitive as India and uh, China. We know that today, the combined uh, uh, um, Africa's uh, uh, combined, all 55 of us, our combined contribution to global trade and output is less than 3%. And yet the combined output and contribution to uh, global trade of one country, one city, Singapore, is almost 6%. And so certainly as Africans, uh, we should be asking ourselves, why are we in this uh, condition? Why do some uh, around the world refer to us as the continent that is the headquarters of poverty in the world? Why do we have such deep underdevelopment of productive structures and industrial development uh, capacities? Well, in part, it is because of what I referred to earlier, this um, colonial economic model which we inherited and which we sustained. And if you look around the world, there is no country, there is no region of the world which is able to extricate itself from poverty uh, without and create jobs, without a, um, an action plan for industrialization, for manufacturing, and for creating jobs um, that over a sustained period of time will actually uh, be uh, uh, um, moving across the value chain uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, value production. And so all of this, all of this has led the uh, Assembly of Heads of States of the African Union uh, to say that we need to, one way to um, uh, leverage on this very important market of 1.2 billion people, which by the year 2050 will have the youngest population in the world, is to have an integrated market. And the first step towards an integrated market is uh, a free trade area from where we will then progress in a linear model of, uh, of integration. Now, when we talk about Africa's integration, we know that this started as far back as 1963 with the uh, founding mothers and fathers of um, the Organization of African Unity whose objective at the time, whose primary objective at the time was the uh, establishment and the defeat of, um, of colonialism in Africa. And certainly with the defeat of um, uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa, I think we can, we can say with confidence that the founding mothers and fathers of uh, the Organization of African Unity did succeed in the objective of political unity um, on the African continent. The next phase of the struggle in Africa is industrial development, economic development, and job creation. In other words, it is the next site of the struggle on the African continent is market integration to make sure that this continent um, becomes globally competitive as any other country, as any other region around the world. And so this is why the African continental free trade area is such a critical step and such a critical tool in the overall um, objectives of uh, Agenda 2063, the Africa uh, that we want. At the moment, we have 38 countries who have uh, ratified uh, the agreement establishing the AFCFTA. Uh, 38 countries, uh, meaning that all of these countries have accepted the legal obligations to reduce barriers to trade, to reduce barriers to intra-Africa investment, uh, and to make sure that um, we confront this challenge of underdeveloped productive capacity and underdeveloped industrial development uh, uh, capacity. It's a very ambitious agreement. Uh, we seek in 14 years time, we seek to uh, eliminate uh, tariff barriers on over 97% of products that are traded in Africa. In 14 years time, they will be traded at zero duty. 
This is the level of ambition that we have for our continent. Similarly, in the area of trade and services, we want to make sure that in a range of different services sectors that we reduce uh, barriers, regulatory barriers to trade uh, in services, that we become more competitive in financial services, in um, uh, tourism services, in construction services, and of course, in the area of telecommunication services. And if you look at the scope of the agreement, it's very, very wide. It covers trade in goods, trade in services, as I've just said. It will also include investment protection and facilitation, competition policy, intellectual property rights, as well as um, a protocol on, uh, on women in trade and a protocol on dispute settlement and a protocol on digital trade. If we have to learn, if there's a lesson that we learn from COVID-19, it is, it is that digital trade and electronic commerce are now at the fore of the global economy. And so as the African continent, in order to confront the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution, we have to be prepared. And that is why the heads of states directed myself and the secretariat to make sure that we negotiate rules a protocol, uh, rules and regulations that will ensure that Africa is prepared um, to leapfrog in terms of uh, digital trade, to confront the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution, and that this protocol on digital trade will position us as a continent um, that is uh, in a few years time, it can be uh, competitive. So digital trade is absolutely a key part of Africa's uh, economic uh, development. Similarly, women in trade and young people in trade are very, very important, uh, uh, very important segments of our uh, society. And this agreement is not for big African multinational corporations only. It's not only for governments. It is only for small medium enterprises. It is also for small medium enterprises, particularly small medium enterprises that are run and led by women and young people, young entrepreneurs. And so that is why we're working very hard to make sure that um, through digital platforms, we create opportunities for interconnectivity of small medium enterprises who want to trade under the rules of the AFCFTA. If you are in West Africa, through these digital platforms that we will introduce, you will now be able to connect with a small medium enterprise or a market in East Africa or Southern Africa and vice versa. And so um, inclusion in the benefits and in the, in the implementation of this agreement is uh, for me a matter of priority, particularly for uh, women in trade. And that is why I um, wholeheartedly welcomed the offer of Standard Bank to work together. Um, uh, the, the CEO of Standard Bank, Mr. Sim Shawalala, um, and I are working together to develop a trade finance uh, facility that will support these small medium enterprises to be able to leverage new markets in Africa, to make use of new markets um, that this agreement um, will open. So these are the pillars of the African continental free trade area. It is more than just a trade agreement. It has to be an, an instrument for Africa's development. I don't believe that in Africa we will get another opportunity at uh, integrating our market. I think this instrument, this legal instrument is uh, probably the last opportunity that we will have as Africans. And as I noted earlier, our founding mothers and fathers achieved the objective of a politically united Africa. The challenge is now on us to confront um, the fragmented nature of Africa's economy, to consolidate our economy, to make sure that through industrial development, we are able to place Africa on a path where we will have a fundamental restructuring of our economies, dismantling uh, this colonial economic model that we inherited and that we sustained, 
Uh, we do want to industrialize. We do want Africa to have in 30, 40 years time, value added uh, productive capacity. And I know that industrialization is not a pill that you swallow and you wake up the next day you've industrialized. It's going to take disciplined industrial action plan implementation decade after decade after decade. There is no shortcut. There's no other way uh, to develop our continent. There will of course be challenges. We know this from experiences around the world um, of markets that uh, have been, been integrated. We know how difficult it is. We know that at certain times, some countries will pull back. Uh, we know the challenges that we will confront on this journey of uh, market integration on the African continent. The European Union, 72 years down the line, is still grappling with some of the challenges uh, of market integration. However, I think we can see from the experience of the European Union that actually the benefits have far outweighed um, what critics 70 years ago would have uh, presented as challenges. The benefits of uh, integration in Europe are very, very clear. If you look at um, Eastern European countries who have recently joined uh, the European Union and you look at the data, you look at uh, GDP uh, per capita and the rise of GDP per capita since uh, Eastern European countries have joined uh, uh, the integrated market, the benefits have been uh, immense. And so I expect that yes, there will be benefits, but I expect that we will have challenges and we must confront those challenges. They relate to a range of things, customs procedures that are cumbersome, that will be difficult to implement in a harmonized way. They will include uh, differentials in levels of economic development uh, that we know in Africa exist. Uh, they will include uh, perhaps uh, uh, governments that may feel that um, they are uh, suffering as a result of reduction in, uh, in tariffs and as a result of uh, uh, losses in revenue. All of these challenges that are associated um, with market integration absolutely will be there, but we will have to confront them uh, head on and we will have to make sure that uh, we industrialize this continent. This is how we unlock Africa's potential, by consolidating this market of 1.2 billion people and by making sure that by the year 2035, when projections are that Africa's combined GDP will be close to $8 trillion, 8 trillion United States dollars, that in that time, that uh, growth is, is harnessed and is, is uh, on the back of uh, productive sector growth and manufacturing uh, throughout and establishment of centers of uh, manufacturing excellence throughout the African continent. The positive and good and encouraging thing is that already we see signals of this potential uh, uh, being unleashed. We know that they are in across the African continent in the middle of the pandemic. There are countries that have been able to reconfigure their manufacturing capacity to produce uh, 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 critical equipment that is required to fight the pandemic, protection, personal protection equipment, germ killing products. We know that uh, in Senegal, in Kenya, in South Africa, in Morocco, and, and a few other countries that um, businesses were reconfigured to meet this challenge of um, the pandemic and to place uh, these particular countries also on a path to industrial uh, development. In South Africa alone, the export market has created over 250,000 jobs. And so we know from the experience of South Africa that um, interconnectedness in trade and, and uh, accessing uh, new markets, that it does actually make a contribution to a country's GDP and that it does actually create decent jobs uh, uh, for, for young people. And this is what, to, we, this is what we want to 
expand uh, throughout the African continent, creation of opportunities for young people uh, through interconnectedness of, um, of our markets. As I mentioned, digitization and digital tools have to be at the heart of a modern trade agreement. That is why we're working with African Bank to develop a pan-African payments and settlement platform which has now uh, uh, been piloted in six, in six countries. We hope that by the end of the year, we will be able to roll out this uh, uh, payments platform. And the objective is simple. It is to overcome the cost of currency convertibility in Africa. We know that uh, in Africa, we have over 42 currencies. If you want to, uh, if you are in Ghana, you want to transact with somebody in Kenya, uh, you have to convert the dollar into uh, first from the CD uh, uh, to the dollar, then from the dollar to the Kenyan shilling. And all of this contributes to inefficiency of trade. It adds to the cost of trade. It adds to uh, uh, the uh, inaccessibility of trade agreements. That is why we believe that this payments and settlement platform will assist in unlocking Africa's potential because we will now be introducing a digital platform that will create seamless, uh, seamless transactions across borders on the African continent. We're also working to make sure that we introduce digital platforms that will place customs procedures uh, on these digital platforms. They're again making customs procedures um, more efficient and more simple instead of, for example, a certificate of origin being uh, verified manually over 14 days, we want this exercise to be undertaken by customs authorities digitally, instantaneously, so that you as a trader uh, to receive your certificate of origin, you don't have to wait 14, 15 days. So there are a range of di digital tools that we are soon uh, introducing into the AFCFTA market to make sure that we boost intra-Africa trade beyond the 18, 15% uh, where it is uh, today. Let me leave you with a positive projection. The World Bank last year uh, released a study that um, by the year 2035, where we implement this agreement effectively, we have the opportunity to lift 100 million Africans out of extreme poverty and moderate poverty, the opportunity to, and, the, and the, the primary beneficiaries being women in trade, we will be able to close the gender salary gap, and we will be able to lift um, these millions and millions of Africans out of poverty through this implementation of this agreement and contributing over 450 billion dollars to Africa's GDP and increasing intra-Africa trade uh, by up to 80%. Very encouraging projections, very, very positive projections. But they are not going to happen by chance. They're not going to happen on their own. We as Africans will have to roll up our sleeves. We as Africans will have to take our own destiny into our own hands and make sure that uh, these projections and that this vision of a, an, an integrated market in Africa becomes a reality. Nobody is going to do it for us. No one is going to industrialize our continent for us. It is all in our hands as Africans. And that is why this agreement is so absolutely critical to making sure that we create jobs for young Africans, that we push back the frontiers of poverty, and that we too, as Africans in 40 years time can lift our heads high and be very proud that we are globally competitive. So I thank you very much for inviting me and I wish you the best uh, in your discussions today. Thank you. SG, I'm certain that your message will resonate with every single African that has listened to you today. Thank you very much for those thoughts. We shall be going over the detail and also some of the strategies that will be required for us to be able to fulfill uh, the dreams of the fathers and mothers, as you mentioned, in 1963. By the way, that invitation for you to come to studio is a standing one. And uh, when you do come, I'm hoping that uh, we will make it a habit. Thank you.
the Secretary General of uh, the African much. Continental Free Trade Area, uh, Wamkelenene, live from uh, Accra. We move on with our program now. Um, let me enable you to meet the members of the panel who are going to be driving today's conversation. And our panelists are Park Tao, Gauteng MEC for Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development. Yofi Grant, CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. Mosa Chabalala, Group CEO of the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency. And Peter Vandal, CEO of NEPAD Business Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, lady and uh, gentlemen. Let me begin uh, with you, MEC uh, Parks Tau. And uh, I wish to cause no political crisis, but uh, as I was uh, uh, doing my research into this, I saw that if uh, Houghton uh, were a country, it would be the seventh largest economy on the African continent. So my question to you, I believe, is pertinent uh, in the light of what uh, the SG has uh, asked us to do, which is to outline what we are doing to contribute to increasing that dismal intra-African trade figure and ensure that we fulfill the dreams of our fathers. Houghton Strategy, MEC, what is it? Well, thank you very much. The Houghton Strategy, which is premised on the growing Houghton Together 2030 Strategy, articul articulates four areas of critical intervention. The first area relates to township enterprise development and with developing programs, including dedicated legislation that would ensure that historically black townships that did not have industrial and commercial activity can have those activities, including funding mechanisms for that. The second area of focus is with regards to industrialization and reindustrialization. In this regard, we're focusing on our special economic zones and developing housing into a multi-tier special economic zone. Some of these have already started. You would know that uh, the Houghton uh, or Tambo SEZ uh, started some time ago, and it's been the licensed SEZ, and it has created platform and, in fact, expanding. Uh, in the Oar Tambo International Airport area and expanding all to also towards Springs. Uh, and that work is already underway. We've already got investors in there. Uh, but also the Tswani Automotive Special Economic Zone that has attracted significant investment more recently from Ford um, with the expansion of their location in South Africa, in fact, with the intention of producing 200,000 vehicles at a minimum per year. Uh, from there with the bulk of this being exported. So the special economic zones are our one set of interventions. The second area from industrialization and reindustrialization is the focus on the 10 high growth sectors that we have identified as the province. And these, I won't go through the entire list, but range from energy to issues around the energy mix, introducing sustainable energy sources. This relates to infrastructure investment, looking at infrastructure as a catalyst for development and creating opportunities for investors to come into areas that have reliable infrastructure but also infrastructure as a counter-cyclical uh, investment on its own, its ability as an investment to generate jobs and economic development. It would include transportation and logistics, tourism and hospitality, ICT. So that's in terms of our industrialization program that we're focusing on as the province. Thank you, ABC, for, for, for that, those introductory remarks. But I wanted to follow up and ask, as the big boy, and uh, as I said again, I was trying to understand just how big Houghton is. I saw 10% of Africa's GDP is, of course, in Houghton. And then I also saw 45% of South Africa's manufacturing capacity in Hout is in Houghton. So the question then becomes, how do you treat those who are now coming in to play with you in your big area where you have been the big dog for a long time, while at the same time trying to make sure that you are fulfilling the ambition of ensuring that we are integrating the region and we are also at the same time uh, bringing together the value chains that the SG was talking about? 
Well, you would know that uh, Gauteng is home to the majority of uh, headquarters of uh, multinational companies that are located on the African continent that have a regional presence and, and their headquarters would be in Gauteng. It is also the head office of the bulk of uh, uh, corporates in South Africa, significant corporates are located here. We are host to the stock exchange. So in essence, the economic location of Gauteng and the strategic importance that it plays uh, is pretty much known. The question is, and we are very cognizant of this, is that Gauteng has a pivotal role to play in the economic development, not just of the province, but indeed um, in the economic development of the country and as a gateway into the continent, because we believe that through, through the logistics uh, capability that we have, through the ability to trade and facilitate investments through uh, the location of the stock exchange and other interventions will become a perfect platform to gain access onto the continent. And therefore, we're reaching out to various partners throughout the continent in terms of how to leverage then the free trade agreement, how to ensure that uh, we can become a, a platform from which we are able to engage uh, and partner with the uh, with uh, our counterparts. And we're seeing subnational governments as playing a particularly important role and a more strategic role because there's a requirement that we invest significantly in infrastructure and in capability that facilitates economic development. And we're partnering with a whole range of agencies, both public and private in the country to ensure that this is able to happen. Absolutely. Yofi, let me come to you in Accra. So you hear how to positioning itself as uh, the I was going to say headquarters, but that's not quite it, right? As a hub for ensuring that we're able to coordinate how we go about investing on the African continent. From the west of the continent, I want to know what Ghana's perspective is and also how you go about it. Keeping in mind, again, as we're saying, yes, it's almost like a beauty contest, but at the same time, we must work together. Yossi, if you can unmute. unmute. Just done. Well, there we go. Thank you. You, you got it. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Um, um, it's it's maybe like a beauty contest and all of us trying to attract the relevant investment into our countries. Um, but the, I think the bigger picture story, as His Excellency uh, um, Kilimane did say, is what is more critical and significant in, at this moment. Um, we all do understand that there are 55 countries on the continent of Africa at various levels of development and some as markets are not strong enough to attract enough investments or to create um, a strong enough economy. So regionalization and um, the regional integration has a, a better template for developing um, the African economy and creating wealth on the continent. Um, in us, for us in Ghana, we have had quite a number of policies um, to move away um, from the export of raw materials and resources. And, and that's very important for Africa because for a continent that is resource rich and has uh, more than 30% of the world's remaining mineral resources from gold, oil and gas, diamonds, copper, um, manganese, iron ore, name it. We are an import dependent continent when we should be an export dependent continent. And almost all processed and uh, finished goods are imported into the continent. Uh, but we do have, we do have a, a sizable economy, uh, 1.3 billion people. And by 2050, as I keep saying, every one in four people in the world will be African. The African economy, uh, the African continent will be one quarter of the world's population. And it will be, um, have a demography where about 60% or so will be less than 35 years old. That is definitely a market waiting to happen. And any business or any country in the world who would not engage with Africa at the moment would not engage with the world of the world that the next wave of the world's economic growth. So it is critical that in as individual country, we reposition ourselves to see how we can move away, firstly, from this um, wholesale uh, export of raw materials and resources yeah. and add value. Yeah, but add value because, first of all, exporting our raw materials hasn't helped with enough wealth. Yeah. And many of our youth are out there looking for work. If we train them well, we'll put them on a track of earning better, and more qualified jobs in an industrial Africa. I believe that it will work well for all of us. In Ghana, we have the one industry, one factory, uh, which is which is that we should build a factory or manufacturing. We each of the 250 
Yeah. Um, uh, this is um, industry. They yeah. also run a great transport um, uh, policy plan to build 40,000 kilometers of new roads, 10,000 kilometers of road. And by the way, yesterday, we had a very, very positive uh, engagement with our town development authority in um, trying to bring value to Coca-Cola and chocolate and see whether we can actually create a real market uh, for Ghana's chocolate uh, in South Africa, being the largest consumer of our chocolate. Yeah. Also, for investment in Ghana. Yeah. Um, Yossi, we, we, Yossi, we're struggling a little bit uh, with your line. I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to uh, get a better reception as we go along. But I had a follow-up question to you, and uh, that relates to how we collaborate uh, regionally, i.e., you take a country, for instance, like Ghana, where you are, and you take a country like uh, Nigeria, and also you can throw into the hat uh, perhaps uh, Cote d'Ivoire. How do you collaborate in terms of uh, setting a strategy that ensures that you are increasing trade between yourselves while at the same time, of course, mindful of national priorities? Eddie, that, that's a very interesting question um, because, uh, and I'm sure you've heard quite recently, We've had enough rumpers on the continent um, from um, uh, citizens of one country operating in another country and um, um, citizens sometimes feeling displaced, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, uh, maybe this is not the platform to even talk about that, but we had all these ethnophobic um, um, and, uh, um, issues that happened down south. The important thing is for us to realize that as individual countries, our markets are not strong enough and there are strategic competencies that can be extracted from each of those companies on the other hand. And so we must recognize the opportunities of engagement. And uh, as I did say before, I, I close on the last session. Yesterday, we had a very um, positive and fruitful conference with the Gauteng Development Authority on the cocoa value chains in Ghana and how we can actually cooperate to expand um, the horizons of trade and export of other finished goods of cocoa or uh, semi-finished goods that can um, um, be uh, further processed in other countries. And we recognize in, in, in Ghana, for example, that um, Nigeria is a big market, Cote d'Ivoire is our neighbor, but we are engaged in significant reforms to ensure that, first of all, we reposition ourselves as a hub for the region. This is so because Ghana, technically, is in the center of the world. We are the only country on latitude zero and longitude zero. So I think in terms of logistics and trade, we are very well positioned. Secondly, we recently developed our ports to be the largest in Africa with a potential of 3.7 million TEUs. Now, that in itself repositions Ghana strategically also as, um, as a point of entry um, for foreign, when I say foreign, I mean outside Africa, um, investors who come onto the continent to be able to manufacture. They need a big port, they need um, terms and conditions that are favorable to enable them access the African um, economy. And I believe that it's some of these policies um, that have been instrumental in having the headquarters of the AFCFTA um, uh, located in Ghana, because we are spearheading um, a major industrialization drive, not only in Ghana, but in, in Africa. Um, we, when we go out to talk about investment possibilities, we don't only talk about Ghana, we talk about Africa, uh, because Africa is resource rich. It is um, um, uh, people rich in the sense that in the future, Africa will be the source of the world's labor pool. And so we take those into our policy initiatives uh, and, and also understand how we can leverage our strengths um, in, 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 in partnerships and integration um, for better uh, returns. And, and I think that is what um, is more important in looking at the AFCFTA. How can each country leverage its position for uh, bigger, bigger uh, benefits in a more consolidated form than in an individual country? Form? So though we we'll go out and compete for investment, we we'll compete for investment um, that will enable us to produce for the continent not just for the country. We look at broader markets, uh, bigger markets, and better value. But we also recognize that there are challenges. Um, there are still political challenges yeah. that um, it, a lot of us um, look inward than outward. Absolutely. Uh, we do have challenges. For example, um, open skies policies that we haven't implemented. Yeah. Uh, we still have um, uh, challenges of uh, 
rights of abode and um, uh, goods of origin and all that that we need to work with. And I, and I believe that His Excellency Wankele uh, Mene did speak um, quite lucidly about all these. He did. He did indeed. And uh, thank you very much uh, for those thoughts. You make some very interesting points. And uh, one of the points I'm going to take around the whole discussion table is the issue of when you go out and you pitch your country, your region as an investment destination. Come on. Why are we not saying that we are asking for investment into the African continent. No longer I am just speaking for country X. And I learned something as well. That uh, latitude zero, longitude zero, I didn't know that. I've been educated. Thank you, uh, Yofi, for those comments. Let's move to, your, uh, to, to, to uh, Mosa. Mosa, thank you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. I want to know from your perspective, you are, of course, right in the city in terms of implementing the strategy that the AMEC spoke about. Let's talk about how you make those things become a reality. The AMEC spoke about the 10 high growth areas, though he didn't go into them. I want to know from a GGDA perspective, how are you implementing those? And I will be listening in very carefully to hear you say you are working with SADC to implement and realize some of these. Thank you very much. And absolutely correct is our role as an investment promotion agency is to practicalize and implement the strategies that are in place and to practicalize the free trade agreement. So maybe to start off with is to indicate that from a Houting perspective over the last six years, I mean, the Houting city region alone um, has exported goods and services to the value of over 1.2 trillion rand to the continent. Um, and from an export perspective as well, you know, 62% of all exports from South Africa collectively that go to the rest of our continent are manufactured goods uh, in Gauteng. Um, the importance of a role of the role of an IPA like ourselves or the GIPC is it's about creating the ease of doing business between um, the various countries. And so, first of all, collaborating with other IPAs like ourselves to understand various things about the different um, e economies on the continent. So, you know, everything from the market size to, to the market stability and growth, um, everything around the regulations. Because our job as a GGDA is to, first of all, um, identify uh, export opportunities for South African and, and particularly housing-based businesses. And after identifying those opportunities and assisting with navigating in those various countries mm -hmm. is to also ensure um, that we facilitate, uh, you know, those trade deals that then happen between the various countries as well. Mm -hmm. um, a very important role that we play for businesses, uh, for SMEs, like has been spoken to, which is very critical, is how do we ensure inclusion, inclusion of women, inclusion of young, of young people? And a critical role that we must continue to play using various platforms is to ensure that we unlock the information bottleneck that, that exists is part of the reason why the trade, the intercontinental trade um, in Africa is less than 20% is because there is significant information gaps. And that's really one of the reasons why we felt as a GGTA that it's important to curate a session like this. First of all, for all of us as Africans to understand what does the free trade agreement mean and how do you leverage on it? And then to understand that there are implementation agencies like ourselves to assist in navigating with um, information, ensuring that um, you know, we, 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 we understand the trade needs of the various countries and we facilitate those relationships. So with IPAs like the GIPC, like the Rwanda Development Board, like um, you know, Namibia Economic Development is we are sister agencies and our mandate is exactly the same. And so what we are able to do is to share the investment opportunities that exist in Gauteng for respective investors from the rest of the continent, yeah. and then support in that, in that investment journey. We do it um, you know, through our one-stop shop uh, where you are able to then be handheld from questions to the actual soft landing of the final investment into the province. And 
equally we do the same for South African business outside of South Africa as well into the rest of the continent. We absolutely collaborate um, from a, a broader SADC region. We are collaborating with the Secretary General's office. We are collaborating with our embassies across the continent to ensure that we have up-to-date um, real trade and economic information yeah. because it's something as basic as, and you know, the MEC uh, always uses the example, is from a GGDA perspective, we know how many eggs Mozambique imports on a weekly basis. Our job is to identify potential uh, uh, businesses locally who have hatcheries who can supply eggs to Mozambique. Mm. Because the ultimate objective of the free trade agreement is to ensure that amongst ourselves as countries, we are not just trading um, raw materials yeah. uh, amongst each other and with the rest of the world, but we are able to export and produce manufactured goods, um, you know, a, a light manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, because our ability to increase those capabilities means that we're also increasing the necessary uh, skilled labor, um, the skilled labor that, that, that is that, that, that is required. We are increasing the job creation opportunities and we are creating the expansion opportunities for businesses that would otherwise remain as micro or small. Oh, oh. Um, you know, a, a, another, a, another very important point is we also recognize that from a Gauteng uh, perspective, the continent is our second largest destination for goods after Asia. Right. And what we are what we are providing is manufactured goods. And, you know, through our special economic zone model, we will be able to increase our manufacturing, or rather we will increase our manufacturing capability yeah. um, and supported by necessary maritime and logistical infrastructure that improves, we are then able to look at how do we ensure that the, export from, the exports from Gauteng are not just um, goods, but also services. We have a highly skilled uh, population in our province. Um, you know, we, we are equally a knowledge economy uh, in Gauteng because our land mass is significantly smaller than other provinces. Yeah. And so those skills um, that exist, how do we ensure that they are exported and shared across the continent? We have existing infrastructure where we are able to create relationships. I mean, you know, um, uh, uh, Yofi speaks about uh, the conference that we had yesterday around the co Cocoa value chain. Cocoa yeah. is uh, one of Ghana's primary, um, 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 uh, you know, no raw materials. And what we know is that South Africa has has significant infrastructure that already exists. Yeah. So the conversations around around the value chain is to say, how do we get South African manufacturers to add processing to the cocoa that we import from Ghana? Once processed and packaged, it is exported from South Africa. Yeah. Now, how that practicalizes our free trade agreement yeah. is to say the, the the farmers in Ghana who produce the cocoa are immediately able to enjoy the export um, and benefits of exporting their raw materials. Yeah. We are importing, and the manufacturers that manufacture here are equally able to create the jobs and the advancements and, and the manufacturing of the goods and further export those goods. Yeah. And therefore, we ensure that all the opportunities are ring fenced into our continent and yeah. we are exporting final products to you know to, to to the rest of the world yeah and in the spirit of that i can hear even in your voice your pronunciation of coco has gone west african coco you are talking about <laughs> totally totally appreciated just one more follow-up question in respect to your opening comments i wanted to know how uh, the discussions that you have with your regional partners the ips that you were talking about how are those conversations are they welcomed because i am trying to think i am a small country my name is malawi or i'm a small country uh, my name is guinea now i'm being thrown in to try to collaborate with a big brother South Africa it's not an easy conversation um you know you would uh, they have been welcomed exceptionally well sure. the first thing um, that, that that's important to recognize is we don't go into any country thinking of ourselves as a big brother of any sort we recognize where our advantages lie. So, for example, I use the example of, um, you know, our industrial uh, infrastructure that already exists. But the first thing that we do with every partner of ours is to present what our priority sectors are. The MEC spoke about our 10 priority sectors. is equally to understand what are the priority sectors of that country. 
And in identifying the low hanging priority, the, the, the mutual priority sectors, we are then able to create efficiency and immediate results by saying, here is where our joint interest is. And in that respective sector, what is it that from your country perspective you would want to achieve? So is it increasing you know, your industrial capability and how do we support that and vice versa? Um, and interestingly, you would, you would think that our priority sectors uh, are diverse, but they're really not. Every country on this continent is looking at increasing their capability in very similar sectors. So whether we are talking about the creative sector and tourism, whether we're talking about our light or advanced manufacturing capabilities, whether we're talking about agriculture and agro-processing, those are all sectors in which we are all collectively as a continent well endowed in. Of course, for a country like South Africa, and particularly for a province like Gauteng, automotive sector is, is a significant sector of ours. We've got the automotive SEZ, um, which is one of our crown jewels in the province. And we also equally understand from our conversations with our colleagues um, you know, in West Africa that for a country like Ghana, um, and uh, you know, they would be interested in increasing their automotive capability. So again, we say, how do we leverage off each other's interests, uh, mutual sectors and capabilities? Yeah. So does it mean that because within the GGDA group, we have the Automotive Industry Development Center, which is primarily focused on you know, the automotive sector, the skills development in the sector, the incubation of SMEs in the sector to ensure that we create tier one, tier two, and tier three manufacturers. We yeah. also have a very strong focus in the province on SME development in the automotive sector. And yeah. so we're building a very solid um, blueprint on how to develop SMEs in the space and how to build skills in the automotive sector. How do we share that with our counterparts in Ghana because the automotive sector is an area of interest? Do yeah. we support them in building um, you know, you know, um, incubation hubs for yeah. the auto sector? Do we support them when they've already landed an OEM investment yeah. and, and in navigating that relationship? So it's continuously mutually building together. It's, it's absolutely not a competition because our interests are aligned. Um. Thank you, Mosa. Peter, I made you listen to all of that because at the end of the day, you work with the people who will allocate capital and decide, yes, this strategy that they are talking about, where they sort of allocate, if you like, the best place, for instance, to produce cars or the best place to produce cocoa or indeed the best place to make the best coffee is X. From your interactions with the IPAs, your interactions with continental bodies like uh, the FCFC, uh, FCFTA Secretariat, are you seeing a common thread emerging that seems to suggest that we are seeing for the first time in Africa that is aware it is one geographical block and that it has the potential, if it works to it, to create this single market that everybody is crowing about, but which will take, as we all know, capital to develop and progress? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, just from the starting point, I think it, from business perspective, there's there's huge recognition of the value of this initiative and, and others that are done at an African Union level that, that promote regional integration um, and the ability to to catalyze growth of businesses across the continent. Um, so, you know, from, from our NEPA Business Foundation perspective, it's always been a challenge of how can we as business now support the execution of these, these plans and, and realize the the benefit of these plans for for business. So I think uh, just to 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 specifically talk about the free trade area agreement. I mean, from a direct perspective, there's huge interest in in promoting and sharing the the benefits of free trade area amongst businesses at large. But then also importantly, seeing how businesses can can begin to shape and inform how the free trade area develops. Uh, you know, things that are coming up in, on our radar at the moment or or things around the investment protocol um, that need to be negotiated shortly, and business should play its role in being a major stakeholder in informing, you know, what can be a successful in investment protocol. But I think more importantly, from a business perspective, the responsibility is to look at some of the indirect opportunities related to the free trade area, and those relate to to three main areas that relates to trade facilitation. Uh, non-tariff barriers, it relates to, to regional infrastructure being a, a key enabler for, for the free trade area, 
And then finally, that's been mentioned you know, the importance of regional value chains as, as the, the huge beneficiaries of, of the free trade area. So within the trade space, you know, I think there are some very good structures that have been put together um, to support the identification and, and resolving of, of some of the trade barriers that are experienced by businesses across the continent. Um, we've had some early looks at those on behalf of business and, and have noticed that whilst they are good and, and good intent, I think there's a lot of capacity behind these structures that need to be need to be put in place to, to really um, realize the benefits of, of these non-tariff structures. So we're supporting where we can in, in that space. Um, then in terms of deepening regional in integration, the, the value of infrastructure is massive, not just from a, a fixed and hard infrastructure perspective, but also from a soft infrastructure perspective. The, the, the role of digital was mentioned uh, quite, quite extensively earlier, but you know, to approach all of these opportunities as corridor opportunities is, is, is critical. Um, so we are piloting at the moment at looking at the North-South Corridor, mm. which runs from South Africa all the way through to DRC, um, looking at what are the opportunities um, to, to create much more efficient value chains, much more effective, uh, efficient logistics routes um, with a view of um, reducing the cost of trade. I think, importantly, competitiveness, both import and export, is driven by cost. So if we are able to reduce the, the, the cost, and particularly the time and efficiency of, of transport across corridors, we can have material impact on improving and leveraging the free trade area. Then finally, from a value chains perspective, I mean, there, there's a lot of discussion already been mentioned from, from the colleagues from the investment promotion side, yeah. but there are major opportunities and be it in agriculture, be it in, in, um, be it in natural gas, be it in the pharmaceutical sector. And I think it's important that as business, we are able to, uh, to articulate, you know, what is the opportunity? What are the impediments to, to, to realizing those opportunities? And then to work with, uh, with the governments and the free trade area secretariat to, to start to resolve and, and um, unblock some of these these uh, challenges to make sure that we realize the potential of the free trade area. So it's just some of our early thoughts what, you know, I think business is hugely excited about this and um, it's all about execution at the end of the day to make sure that we, we realize the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the issue of our infrastructure, in particular the hard infrastructure side of it. There was the Kazungula border post that has bridge that was opened uh, the other week. And uh, having uh, traveled uh, between Zimbabwe and South Africa at uh, Bayad Bridge and spent more than 12 hours waiting there, I definitely can speak with authority about the frustrations uh, that businesses and ordinary people who are trying to just go about their daily lives experience when they try to cross this border. So hopefully uh, that will be sorted out. But Peter, I wanted to know, so here at CNBC Africa, we have been asking the question, who has traded under the FCFTA so far? Believe me, not a single company has been able to come to us, and I've been asking many questions, and say, we have done a deal under the FCFTA. I want to know if you see any evidence that the treaty, which came into effect on the 1st of January 2021, is beginning to make a difference in terms of uh, getting those goods across borders? Or are we going to have to wait another uh, 10, uh, 15 years before we begin to see an improvement? Uh, I think the, the Secretary General said it earlier, I mean, there's no shortcuts to, to execution. And, and this is a journey that we're on. If you speak to any of the corporates that, that we speak to on a daily basis, they recognize that this is a long-term journey. I think everybody recognizes that there is potential and there's there's huge potential for for growth of their own businesses if it is successful so at this point you know i think the intent is what's important and the the intent to start to move on some of the trade barriers has certainly been evident from from our side so you know i think it is a journey and and we look forward to as business trying to contribute to to making sure that this is successful mc i want to come to you and uh, one of the issues that I have been asking people that we interview here on CNBC Africa, and as you would know, they include uh, CEOs and uh, senior company officials, is around the issue of uh, increasing capacity while at the same time we are saying we want to be able to, uh, sorry, local capacity while at the same time we want to be able to uh, grow export side. This, of course, is a policy that was announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa and that I know many, many, many good minds, far better than mine, have been seized with. I want to know from a government perspective how the two coexist. You want to increase the manufacturing capacity and reduce imports, great, increase employment, etc., etc. But at the same time, you need to export some of the stuff that you are doing. How do those two work together, MEC? 
Well, I don't think it should be very difficult for them to coexist. Firstly, it is important that we build local industrial capacity, local production capacity, and that makes us more competitive. That makes us ensure that we uh, can reduce the, the levels of Im import and have import substitution programs uh, that en enables the local economy to grow. And that becomes an important objective. And we're looking at this within the context of what, what, what would be our global trading partners, who are the dominant trading partners at this stage. So we should be building capacity to ensure that we build our local economy to ensure that we can improve trade across the continent and to ensure that our industries are able to live out of each other. Uh, so I, I think as almost everybody is saying, let's look at ourselves as a continent, as a regional block uh, that builds its own capacity so that this block goes out to compete with the rest of the world. And I think that the question that you asked was the end um, was very important when you asked the question, is there a company that can say we've actually invested in line with the free trade agreement? And I think uh, it's a challenge to all of us who are involved in the sector. In fact, I was about to say to Yofi and Musa, isn't that the most immediate challenge? Isn't that something that we should be saying while well, we're on this platform? Yeah. Yes, Ghana, yes, South Africa. There's a challenge being put out. Can we demonstrate that by the end of this year, these industries, these enterprises are able to leverage off the agreement and ensure that the investment happens so that we can practically demonstrate through action that something can happen. Because until somebody has moved in first, yeah. uh, it's not going to, to gain the traction. But when we build the traction, that's the point at which uh, more and more companies, more and more countries yeah. will have appetite to participate actively. Yeah, I want the thoughts of both Ayofi and Namosa very quickly because I also want to take questions. I've got one million questions, as you know. This is my pet uh, subject matter. Uh, but I don't know if, Ayofi, you want to, co to, to, to respond to any of the yes. points that have been raised by the others as well as uh, uh, Mosa after you. Yes. Very interesting points raised. And I, I think for, for us at GIPC, the, the right now the most important steps, and they are still learning steps because um, this hasn't been done before. And if we take the example of the EU, to consideration we knew it was a long adult task. Mm. One of the big challenges we have right now is the engagement of the private sector. Um, and uh, we are trying very well to actually embrace the private sector into this whole AFCFTA um, uh, agenda and um, development. Um, for governments, yes, the discussion is always at the formal level. But how well are we bringing in the private sector to be part of the discussion mm. such that it doesn't become um, an imposition on them, but it rather um, brings them in to understand what the opportunity. Because at the end of the day, I'm not sure that it's going to sit on the on, on, on the on the tables of government to facilitate trade alone. No. It's going to be private sector. As mm. I speak, some of the private sector entities in Africa already are very regional. For example, Ecobank, that has, I think, close to 35 um, um, uh, country um, offices. Um, and so the private sector has already taken a lead in regionalizing its business. And so we need to then, as facilitators, as Musad said, we need to then pull the private sector in. So far as I'm aware, there are two co companies in Ghana already um, that have um, done some trading under the AFCFTA. Whoa. But that is a, a woeful demonstration. By now, we should be having a mad rush of goods coming from other countries in Africa mm -hmm. and goods leaving our shores to other countries in Africa. And that is why I put this beautiful kente cloth behind <laughs> us, my background. Uh, because that is in itself is a major... Um, de demonstrative um, fabric of African unity yeah. that we need to be trading among ourselves. That it's the whole Africa experiment is a fabric knit by different um, threads that should yeah. come from each country. Yeah. And I'm yeah. so happy to hear to say that we need to leverage our strengths, our, our individual strengths, into collective gain. Yeah. Um, and we need to also break down those bureaucracies and barriers yeah. that are limiting us. Um, as trading nations. Well, no question about that. I can tell you uh, the other day when we were celebrating Africa, Africa Day here on CNBC Africa, one of our anchors came in a Kente and she was absolutely uh, beautifully packaged. I can say that uh, without question. I wanted also to say to you, those two companies that have done deals under the FCFTA, they have a free 
open door to walk through to CNBC Africa and say, I want to be interviewed. Using my limited power, I decree that uh, that interview happens to the guys in West Africa. Mosa, your thoughts? Thank you. Mosa, you to, there? To respond, it's Thank to you. respond in a very um, brief way because I know that time, you know, we've got time pressures. Is Yes. I, I mean, first of all, let me actually say off the bat, uh, on behalf of myself and you, three, is we are absolutely accepting the challenge that the NEC has put forward to us. That is our job. But it is easier because even within the free trade, there is a defined basket of goods that every country has put in as part of their, um, you know, their, their, their tariff-free goods and, 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 and services that, that, that we're putting forward. Our job really is to identify the opportunities for those goods um, and or services in the respective countries and build the pipeline of businesses that we can link to those opportunities. And then doing that link through the different um, uh, uh, platforms that have been created, uh, you know, by, 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 this, by, by the secretariat and his team. Yeah. So it is a learning process. And of course, there has to be, you know, um, IPAs like ourselves actually that are driving implementation. It's it's, it's the basis of our existence, um, and so focusing on the on, on the basket of goods and ensuring that in that process we're continuously bringing the full ecosystem together. So yeah. it's not just about the the, the businesses. Um, it's also equally about bringing the funders on board because the opportunities are across the board. And in the absence of also linking opportunities, businesses, and funding. You yeah. really are going to have limited success. Yeah. I'm going to try and take two quick questions here, and there are lots of them. So I, I, I will be unable to go through all of them. I've been told we've got about six minutes or so of the show left. There's a question here from uh, Lawrence Lane. And uh, he says, in order to fast track the realization of this dream, there needs to be specific initiatives to ensure communication on the available intra-African activities and that they are pronounced with a catalog of what goods and services are available. And I think this speaks to the issue of information that Mosai raised earlier. And I think I can easily easily answer that and say uh, the uh, Africa Export Import Bank has got a comprehensive service on this and they are providing information on this and I think the African Development Bank as well. He speaks about the decolonization of the colonial model. Yes, absolutely agree with you. Lutando Makiwane says it would be interesting to understand how access to energy will be addressed. What are the plans? I think that is uh, for the uh, national governments but we've got the MEC here uh, with us so I can quickly ask him to answer that one please. MEC? Well, I think firstly, it's important that we look at the diversified energy mix uh, and to ensure that we're able to attract private investors into the energy mix through facilitating independent power producers and ensuring that uh, we enter into a power purchase agreement, particularly through our local government system, uh, at least in the country, the local government is critical to the distribution of electricity. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have developed the legislative framework that now enables uh, the, the production of, of um, energy through independent power producers is a significant step forward. And I think it needs to be followed up with the necessary investment both by the private and public sectors. Just judging by the number of questions that we are getting, there's intense and a lot of interest uh, uh, in this matter. And I'll direct people to our website and uh, hopefully as well we can see ways in which we can wrap in uh, some of those questions so that we direct them to the right officials here. But for today, I'll take two more. And this question is coming from Lawrence uh, Lehotwani. He says, I'd like to hear more about the industrial development and the fourth industrial revolution around the African continent and availability of developing a sustainable 14-year plan. I think he's talking to the need to try to make sure that that 14 years that the SG spoke about are used fruitfully. One more question, and this comes from N.K. Obasi. The issue of xenophobia needs immediate and intense attention for it to work. What is the AFCFTA's plan? I think that one will kick it out of the park a little bit because uh, I don't think it's an issue that the, the AFCFTA addresses. It's more for the African heads of state and uh, government. So I'll take one more here. This is from James K. Nsofwa. Does AFCFTA have a structured plan on infrastructure development that will see this agreement materialize. I will make it a free for all. Who wants to take the last question? I, I think I'll attempt to take that because um, the you. AU itself had an Africa um, um, 
Africa infrastructure plan in which was it's pushing for the linkaging of a link linking of African countries with infrastructure both railways and roads and and so I, I believe that that will be instrumental in almost actualizing um, a lot of the trade activity in the AFCFTA um, but it should just go beyond uh, the roads um, and somebody asked a question about energy because energy is critical and I, I guess the answer was very apt how do we bring private uh, sector capacity and capability um, to provide the energy to fuel Africa's industrialization. I think at the end of the day, um, we need to also recognize um, a statement my president did make about um, um, Ghana beyond aid, which I believe has been extra extrapolated to be Africa beyond aid, that we do have the capacity, we do have the capability. And I did mention we are a resource-rich continent, we are mm. people-rich Continent, and we can't do it. I mean, we, we actually can't do it. We can't be there uh, still relying on handouts and gifts in mm. what um, has been aptly described as the uh, post-colonial economy yeah. um, and, and take it as a format to develop. We have all that it takes, and so we should be able to do it. And um, it's important that with the linkages are there. Yeah. Um, the uh, sky's policies are there. Yeah. Um, the issue of an African passport is there. Uh, we should leverage on our strengths individually and collectively to build a vibrant market that is already wealthy, yeah. but its people are poor. Now more than ever, no question about that, yeah. definitely, without a doubt. Um, there was one more point here about uh, a strategy for the industrial development of Africa and the fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, who do I throw that one to? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think here. Um, Peter, do you want to take that one? I was going to offer to assist. I mean, the answer is really the same as what's just been shared um, mm. from the colleagues. You know, these these frameworks do exist at an African Union Union level, both from industrialization and infrastructure. And the I mentioned in what I said earlier, the 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 free trade area agreement will only be successful if we execute on the continental plans around um, infrastructure development, regional infrastructure development, and regional value chains. So, you know, all of that sits within those industrial um, plans. Uh, to my knowledge, I know that at Southern Africa level, for example, there are priorities in agro-processing, agro in um, mineral beneficiation, and in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, I believe at a continental level, it's the same sectors that are, that are priorities. But there are these plans of place that are at a continental level being executed by the, by the uh, African Union and by the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. Um, so these plans are in place and, and the free trade area will make these a reality as well. Thank you very much, Peter. Mosa, I'm going to ask you for 30 seconds for your final comments. Um, thank you very much. You know, I, 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 I want to close with um, just continuing with where, 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 where your fee ended with mm -hmm. regards to infrastructure. I want to encourage us collectively as Africans to think broader than the limitations that currently exist. So we may argue that road uh, and rail, inland uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure is quite weak, but 36 countries on our continent are coastal. And so we need to think about th that that opportunity already exists to, to, to move goods between ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the opportunity to, again, um, air at Oh, looks like uh, uh, the connection has failed us there. Let's see if we can reconnect to uh, Mossa very quickly. Mossa, are you back? Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, just close it quickly if you can. Oh, okay. So, 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 so very quickly, get in touch with us. Go to our website and yeah. get more information about what the free trade agreement is and how, as a business you are able to get support from us to participate meaningfully in the economy of the continent. Absolutely. And uh, those other portals as well include the African Development Bank, the Africa Export Import Bank, the AFCFTA Secretariat itself, and the African Union. Uh, Yofi, quickly, your final thoughts. I'm an editor. I can do things in 30 seconds. What about you? I, I think there is absolutely no reason why Africa won't drive the next wave of development in the world, in the global economy. Africa has the resources, Africa has the opportunity, Africa has the people, and yes, we can. We just need a little tweaking of the mindset and move away from the gifts and handouts and use our own initiatives. We can't be a wealthy continent and have its people poor. But the way around it is to add value of those exports that we've given out um, in the raw state by adding value. That's where the value is and going up the, the value chain. 
And I believe that we should change that narrative of Africa importing everything to Africa exporting everything. Yeah. And that is where a great potential for wealth creation for our teeming youth lies. MEC, you have the final say. One of the critical impediments remains uh, infrastructure and logistics. And I think that an investment in the requisite infrastructure and logistics is going to be critical, both by the public and the private sector. And I think public sector must create an environment in which we enable investment into such infrastructure so that we are able to facilitate the movement of goods and people uh, throughout the continent and through that we see greater integration. And I think it, it becomes easier for the private sector to come on board when, in fact, they realize that moving the goods is not as difficult as has been in the past. Thanks. There are many takeaways here. Two that I'm going to mention from my side. One is that uh, Ghanaian cocoa is going to be processed into uh, chocolate right here in Johannesburg. Two, your definition of who's foreign must say the foreign person is the one who comes from outside the African continent. Thank you uh, for watching us and listening to us uh, discuss uh, this issue of ensuring that we are able to fulfill the dreams that started in 1963, by the way, when I was born to today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Until next time.